This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. StoryBeat episodes are available at storybeat.net and on all major podcast apps and platforms. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to leave us a rating or review? And please subscribe to StoryBeat wherever you listen to podcasts. Well, my guest today, the revered actress Kathleen Chalfant, has spent more than five decades performing on stage, screen, and TV perhaps best known for her devastating portrayal of Vivian Barron, a scholar battling cancer in Margaret Edson's Pulitzer Prize-winning play, Wit, for which she received numerous awards, including the Obie, Drama Desk, Lucille Lortel, Outer Critics Circle, and Ovation. Kathleen made her Broadway debut in Dance With Me, followed by M. Butterfly. She portrayed six distinct characters, including Hannah Pitt and Ethel Rosenberg in the original cast of Tony Kushner's groundbreaking Angels in America, receiving nominations for both the Tony and Drama Desk Awards. Among her dozens of performances on New York stages, Kathleen has starred in A Woman of the World, Sarah Rules for Peter Pan on her 70th birthday, Alan Bennett's Talking Heads, for which she won the Obie, and Twelve Dreams, which was written and directed by James Lapine. Kathleen has graced some of America's most prominent stages, including the McCarter, Long Wharf, Guthrie, Yale Rep, Actors Theater of Louisville, Mark Taper Form, and many others. You may have seen Kathleen on the silver screen in movies like Kinsey, Duplicity, The People Speak, A Price Above Rubies, The Last Days of Disco, and many more. She's also well known for her numerous TV appearances, including playing Margaret Butler on Showtime's The Affair and on Doubt, The Guardian, Rescue Me, House of Cards, The Americans, Madam Secretary, Elementary, all of the various law and orders, and in TV movies like A Death in the Family, Lackawanna Blues, Stephen King's Storm of the Century, and Georgia O'Keeffe. Kathleen's a founding member of the Women's Project, and in 1975, she helped Robert Moss establish Playwrights Horizons in its home on 42nd Street. Among her many influential turns as an acting teacher, she's on the faculty of the graduate acting program at the new school. So for all those reasons and many more, I'm deeply honored to welcome the towering force of nature that is Kathleen Chalfant to Storybeat today. Kathleen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. I'm very happy to be here. Well, I'm very happy to have you here. So let's go back in time a little bit to your origins. I know that when you first started going to college, you studied Greek. It had nothing to do with the theater, although the Greeks were pretty good at the theater. Um, What was it that eventually got you interested in being not only involved in the theater, but performing? Well, actually, my study in Greek was uh, the anomaly. Um, All my... (laughs) All my life before that, I never really wanted to do anything seriously but be an actor. So when I was a little kid, I was not an only child. I had a, my older brother was 14 years older and I, he's died now, but I refer to him always as my glamorous gay brother. And he was the person closest to the theater that I knew when I was a kid. But when I was little, my grandmother used to take me to the movies and I would act out the movies in the backyard. Mm, mm. Um, I, for a long time, actually wanted to be a cowboy in the cowboy movies. Really? I I loved horses, and I perfected a kind of cowboy smirk um, that I worked (laughs) on a lot. And then in high school, I was in the, the, I did all plays in the drama department, and worked at a a small community theater um, in Alameda, California, because I grew up in Oakland, California, on Fruitvale Avenue, an avenue that some people might know. Yes, indeed. Um, So anyway, I firmly intended to study the, um, to go to, to do the theater at college where I went to Stanford, and I 
but my boyfriend, I was then 17, my boyfriend had just uh, gotten kicked out of college. <laughs> And he lived in Oakland and I lived in Palo Alto. They were 90 miles, 90 minutes apart. And both the theater and the boyfriend happened at night. So I have to say that for this entirely ignoble reason, I didn't do the theater. He was an intellectual, a, a philosopher, a lover of uh, phenomenology and all like that. And he thought that I should um, study Greek. And I had a free period as a freshman to study Greek because in those days, the California public school system of which I was a product was one of the great educational institutions in the world. Mm -hmm. And having, I went to it all my life and I ended up with a scholarship to Stanford, but I also ended up uh, not having to take freshman biology at Stanford, <laughs> uh, like everybody else did, because we had laboratory biology in my inner city high school in Oakland, California. So anyway, so then I studied Greek and somehow I forgot what I was, what I had always wanted to do. So but I but you Greek. got back to it somehow. Uh, well, I did in a very specific way, actually, that had something to do with Greek, because I met while studying Greek, my husband, who's now my husband, Henry, and I went through quickly and he went through pretty slowly. Otherwise, we'd have missed each other altogether because he's five years older. But I was going to say you you went and studied Greek because you were in love. But I mean, the, your real love, which was the theater, you had to get back to. I had to get back to, and that love, you know, the way you're in love when, uh, when you're 17, I stayed with that man for a while, for like three years. But then I took up with Henry. Right. And I had gra I graduated early. So Stanford has the quarter system. So I graduated at the end of the fall semester. So on Christmas break, rather, uh, it was kind of a big deal in those days. It was 1965. Mm -hmm. um, Henry and I went to Mexico together. And on the way back, because I was supposed to start a graduate program in Greek as, at the end of the Christmas break, and I said to Henry, you know, I really don't want to teach Greek to prep school boys. And he said, well, uh, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I've always wanted to be an actress. And he said, why don't you do that? Well, that was very good. That was very encouraging. Well, that was very encouraging. And I can't believe I was 20, not quite 21. And I did, I think, what must have been the most courageous thing I've ever done in my life after um, explaining to my parents that I was in Mexico with Henry, which caused a <laughs> certain amount of kerfluffle. But <laughs> then I went to the university and said, I'm going to have to pay you back my graduate fellowship because I'm leaving graduate school. And um, I had just been elected chief justice of the student court, even though I went to Mexico with my boyfriend. And um, so I said, I can't, I won't be able to be the chief justice of the student court either. And I left school and I got a job and enrolled in an acting course. Near Stanford. In, Stan in, in Stanford. San Francisco. Um, and was, that, AC, was ACT around at that time? No, it wasn't. ACT wasn't around at that time. I, what I should have done, which is in part an answer to your last question, what I should have done was to have applied to a graduate acting program, and I probably would have gotten into it, but I, I don't think I believed that I had a right to do that. I don't think I believed that the thing that I wanted to do was serious enough. So I began studying with an acting teacher in San Francisco, a man named Larry Bedini, who, who had spent many years, even though he was Italian, at the, <laughs> at the Abbey Theater. Um, in Dublin and uh, was a follower of Stanislavski. And, and, the, and I studied with him um, for that year. 
I, the reason why I go back in time with folks is to kind of show the listeners that it doesn't just, you're not just all on the stage at the beginning as somebody who's in a lead part. It usually takes a while to get there. And what I find fascinating about what you just said is, is that you had a degree, if not a, a large degree, of insecurity about whether you should be doing this or not. You knew you wanted to, but you, you weren't certain. And yet you're, the hallmark of pretty much every performance I've ever seen you in is great certainty. You, when you're on stage or on a, on a film or a TV show, we know that you know what you're doing. It's not in doubt. So the fact that you started off not sure of yourself or whether this was the smart move, I find interesting. Well, and that continued for a long time. I mean, I now finally at 75 believe that I know two things. I believe I know how to do something. Mm -hmm. And also that acting is something you know we all understand that singing is a thing and dancing is a thing and gymnastics are a thing and downhill racing are a thing but it takes a while to understand that acting isn't just talking oh and it took, and i i discovered it i have to say i had a, an epiphany about it in a in a, a kind of extraordinary way which is a wonderful story it sounds this sounds like <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like one of those stories that you put in your memoirs because it um, invo involves Corin and Vanessa Redgrave. But <laughs> <laughs> for reasons that are too difficult to explain, um, they both are friends of ours. But anyway, as people may know, about five years before he died, Corin had a terrible, I guess, stroke. Nobody ever could explain exactly what it was and nearly died. And when he, and was unconscious for a long time, and when he woke up, he had no short-term memory. Wow. And it never came back. So a year, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half after the event, Corin was staying with us at our house. And the year leading up to the event, he'd been very, very active in all sorts of politics, uh, one important issue was getting the British detainees out of Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. When Corin was staying with us, somebody came and brought him poems from um, some of the detainees that he'd worked with who were still in Guantanamo. And as it happened, when that happened, uh, Vanessa was visiting and we were in our kitchen, which was just off the living room, Vanessa and I making um, lemonade for everybody. Right. And Corin started to read those poems cold off the paper, and it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Wow. And that's when I absolutely knew that acting is a thing. And oh, really? Corin did a number of other uh, um, events. He did the uh, a whole bunch of quite long theatrical events uh, that he read because he couldn't remember the lines and was in quite a number of movies. But it was a great, that was a great revelation to me. So that was a, a moment of epiphany for you, that this is yeah. something that not only was a thing, but really something that you wanted to do for Well, it, by then, I mean, this was only 10 years ago, not even. Oh, this is only 10 years ago. Only so, 10 years ago. So you're saying that this entire time you weren't sure acting was a thing? I guess I didn't understand how it was. I didn't really understand that it was like singing and dancing and downhill racing and all like that. I mean, I must have known. Well, sometimes, act act been, so, sometimes but, actors get paid huge sums of money. Um, so it must be a thing. <laughs> I guess. I guess, I think. I mean, I now I know. I know it is. And one of my teachers, who uh, we lived after we got married, Henry and I moved to Europe, and we lived in Rome for a couple of years. And I studied in Rome with a wonderful, wonderful teacher named Alessandro Fers, F E R S E N, who's who's dead now. Um, and he too was a Stanislavskian, and he actually looked like Stanislavski. Mm. He, uh, uh, and so I studied acting in Italian in Italy, which was a, a wonderful experience. But one of the things that interested him that he used to talk about was what was the impulse in people to want to turn into somebody else? Hmm, interesting. And that was the kind of acting that was interesting to him, the sort of transformative 
kind of acting, the invisible kind. As I, I, I like to think of it as the difference between, it shows my generation, but the difference between uh, Laurence Olivier, who was a performative actor, yes. and liked you to see how it was done. Right. And Ralph Richardson, who, who it was a, a completely mysterious all the time. Right. Well, wasn't it Olivier who uh, famously said that once he had the, the costume and the shoes and the hair, that he, then he was in character? Actually, he said once he had the nose. The nose. <laughs> well, that's definitely performative. That was from the outside in. Right. And of course, he also, and I'm totally botching the uh, the actual quote, but he w once said that, you know, when uh, he was doing Marathon Man with Dustin Hoffman, and Hoffman's going through all of his uh, machinations of trying to figure out the character, he says, why don't you just try acting, my boy, or something yep. like that. Yes, <laughs> try acting, dear boy. <laughs> all right, so, so for you then, was acting a calling? Is it something that you just had to do? Or is it something that you were just fascinated by and wanted to do? It's very odd, that question, because I, I have never wanted to do anything else. So it must be a calling and, then. And it is the only thing that I think I have a gift for. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm okay at other things, but uh, it's the thing I, I guess I sort of have a gift for it. You were born to do that. You were born to be an actress. Uh, I guess, maybe. Well, well, I mean, you've been doing it a while and, um, you know, I, I've been at this for a while too in the, in the industry and, um, you know, I can't do anything else either. I don't know anything else to do. You and know. that gives you joy. And it gives you, sure, it gives you joy. And you can't imagine your life doing it any, any other way. And it would probably be miserable for you if you were forced to do manual labor for, for your income or that kind of thing. You, well, though, oddly, I think I, I, oddly, manual labor would be the least onerous <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, well, I mean, it depends on the kind being, of being an, a, being an accountant isn't for you. No. <laughs> um, no. And, uh, running something, running some organization. I've had a lot, I've helped a, a number of theaters get started and I've been involved, uh, you know, uh, on the boards of not-for-profit theaters right. for a long time. And I, some people love, there are people for whom being a producer is an art form. Oh, there, for sure. A couple of people that I think of are, are Doug Abel at the Vineyard Theater in New York, Andre Bishop, at Lincoln Center, right? Um, th that is uh, where their artistry is uh, expressed. Well, and and those folks are not only extremely valuable; they're not all that common. When they when they're able to take the art form and push it somewhere, right. which those folks can do, because not every producer has that ability. But there are lots of really wonderful producers that can take the material and make it happen. Yeah. But uh, someone like an Andre Bishop is pushing the art form into a whole new place. That's okay. something different. All right, let's talk about performance and, and preparing for performance. When you get a role, um, when you're, you've picked it or someone's picked you or however it works, aside from reading the script, what would you say is your approach? How do you start to think about a performance at the beginning stages of, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this? I used to do research beyond the script. And you have to be very careful doing that because what often happens is that you end up thinking about the character that you would have written, not the character that the playwright has written. All right, so that's good. I try to find everything I need to know in the text. So it that I, the, text is, the text is where I begin from. And when I'm in the very beginning, I need to see if I can speak the person, if I have any connection with the person. And sometimes you just don't. And what do you do when you just don't? You'd say, I'm sorry, I really shouldn't do this. I see. So you've backed out of things then, yes? Right. I mean, now, I, now people ask me if I want to do things. And until, you know, the world came to an end uh, in March. Well, for, for <laughs> all of us, yes. <laughs> There used to be, I used to be able to, to decide between um, things. I'm, I'm not, this is not in some grandiose way. We're not talking about gigantic movies, but people send me plays often and I read them and can decide whether I feel 
as though I have anything to offer. And sometimes you just don't, either because you resist the material um, for who knows what reason. Sometimes I'm sent things and I think I'm just too old. Hmm. You know, there are, there are parts that depend upon you being in the game, you know, plays in the canon that I haven't done and now won't do because I'm just too old. I don't think that there are any of the major Chekhov heroines, for instance, that I could do maybe the seagull, maybe you could say, you know, it's unclear how old she is or how old she needs to be. But otherwise, all those women are in the game. So, so they're all just barely, they've just passed childbearing age or they have, you know, youngest children or whatever. And by the same token, or no, I mean, it's the same argument, I, I don't think that a 40 year old woman playing Hedda Gabler doesn't um, deal with the issue because if you lived in that little tiny town in Norway all alone without being married and you got to be 40 and you're fine, then you're fine. That's not the question. It is a different, and it, and it seems to me it doesn't illuminate the text then. So you've been at this long enough where obviously um, people are coming to you with stuff. You're not, you're no longer really auditioning all the time or, or at all probably. Um, I audition for uh, movies and television. Okay. I don't. But plays, they're coming to you, right? They know you're going to, you're going to start a role for someone or you're going to be in a classic role, or you're going to star in something. Yeah, I mean, on Broadway, well, I don't act on Broadway very much unless I've come with it, you know, from the beginning. So every once in a while I have to, I've had two, I've had two auditions recently and I blew both of them. Really? Yeah, it wasn't recently, it was in, the, in a, a couple of years ago. How, how do you blow an audition by doing that? Um, in one case, I, because it was a play with a very particular uh, accent, a particular Northern Irish accent. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was audition the vowels, <laughs> not, the, not the character. Um, <laughs> and that was, I'm sorry, because I, I would have loved to have been in that play, but then in the end, if I'd been in that play, I couldn't have done a whole bunch of other stuff that <laughs> happened afterward. And then the other one was, um, I auditioned for My Fair Lady, uh, the one on, on Broadway. Right. And I, you know, I can't sing. I'm terrified of singing. It scares me. Well, the musicals aren't your yeah. thing. No. But I sort of thought, oh, well, this would be cool. And they, and I went in saying, but anyway, it was, uh, it was embarrassing, actually, that audition. Um, but, but mostly I don't. Audition. All right. So, so once you've got apart once you whether it's tv or film or on stage okay so you know you've got the text in front of you yeah. and the text is going to give you hopefully all the clues you need to figure out a character i assume that some of that's going to come through the rehearsal process as well unless you're doing a tv show in which case there might be limited if any rehearsal process right. so so therefore they're expecting you to come in having it yeah. uh, in a play you've got days if not weeks to rehearse uh, and you can kind of figure things out with the director and the other actors. Do you start to take notes on the text? What is your process? What do you go I, through? You know, I don't. One of the things is that I try to learn the lines as quickly as possible. That seems to me to be important because it seems to me that it, it, for anything, you need to put the words inside yourself. So once you have the words memorized, that really helps you to find how you're going to be in that character. Well, I think until you have the words memorized, you can't know how you're going to be because we are uh, transparent creatures, uh, mm -hmm. human beings and certainly actors. And so um, if what you're playing is, what the hell is the next thing I say? And then you say it, mm -hmm. um, there's a filter between you and the and the speaking of the line. Well, there's no way for you to be in the moment if that's the case. No. There's no way for you to be delivering what's happening right this moment. Right. That isn't true when you do doing uh, audiobooks or our peculiar now this new world of Zoom performances. Right. But in that case, when you're reading it, rehearsal is not your friend. Why is that? 
because you begin to in a in a not sufficiently informed way you begin to try to reproduce what you did before that you liked mm. whereas if you have a kind of gift for reading for storytelling sometimes the second or third pass at it is the best you're going to going to get it's because, not going to get any better because you're not off book right it's a it's alive still alive is it, um, is it the same for you in terms of the character development for something that's an, a well-known play versus something where you're creating the first shot at the character? Like when you did Angels in America, where you were the first one in. Well, um, yes, it is, because it's not, I mean, you, you can't help but know something of the history of the play. And I remember once I didn't do that, once uh, my daughter, uh, was born during a production of um, uh, Major Barbara, and uh, you, you were pregnant during Major Barbara. Yeah, yes, it was. This was a, in a community theater, sort in Woodstock, a kind of fancy community theater in Woods, Woodstock, New York. Before we came to New York, and the director um, had five children, so he and I was very, very pregnant. So he said, "Look, um, you can be Barbara." or you can be Rummy Mitchens. When is this baby due? And I said, uh, he said, okay, let's take it. You obviously you want to be Barbara. So yeah. So off I would rehearse Barbara, Barbara, Barbara. And the Andromache, our daughter, was born in the third week of rehearsals of uh, Major Barbara. I've never heard of anybody being cast by delivery date before. Oh, <laughs> it probably happens more than you. It uh, probably does. Anyways, I've just never heard of it. So in any case, as you know, Major Barbara is an extraordinarily difficult play. And there's a big turn right in the middle for Barbara, which is entirely arbitrary. I think it is, continues to be arbitrary. The thing about Shaw is that Shaw understood men very well and found women mysterious. And so he just made them do stuff. And so, but I didn't know that at the time because I was quite young. And so I was trying to figure it out and everything. And so I looked at the movie the Wendy Hiller movie right. of Major Barbara. And so I never could do anything but try to be Wendy Hiller after that. Oh, boy. Um, which I don't think I accomplished. Um, you, you know, that that's because she's Wendy Hiller and you're not. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so I... And truth be told, most of the work... I've, most of my work in the theater has been in new plays. I haven't done uh, very many, I haven't done very many classic plays. Do you enjoy that? Do you enjoy finding something about a new character and helping a playwright break a character that way? I guess so. I mean, it's what I know. It's in a way, it's been, it's been my, my profession. And it's also true that that's what you do in television because in television, the writers are writing a new play every week. Of course. Or a char if you do a long running character in a show, it's the, the actors and the writer who carry the character through. So you're making it up as you go along. Well, the great big differences between TV and film and stage. I mean, huge differences in TV. The producers are really running the show. In a film, the director's really more in charge, yes? And, right. on, and, and the, on stage, it's the director as well. The, and the playwright. I mean, and the playwright, of course, of course. On stage, the the text is is what you is all, get from, yeah, yeah, because the 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 playwright owns their copyright, his or her copyright. Which yeah. once you get out of the world of the theater, you no longer, as a writer, own your copyright. So other people have say that you don't. Well, uh, and one of the great things about television is the producers are the writers. That well, I should have said that, but yes, the producers are the writers, all with some exceptions, but almost right. always they're the writers, mm -hmm. and they have they're in charge. Yeah. So they still have some or a great deal of power in the case of television, where they lose power. Writers lose most of their power on, in motion pictures and feature films, unless right. they're also the director and or the producer. So, so in other words, you're you've had a, a lot of experience with bringing a new character to life. Right. Therefore, you're not you're not doing a Wendy Hiller thing. You're not imitating anything else. You're finding what's there for the first time. That makes a big difference, doesn't it? It does. I have to say that I wasn't the first pers person to play Vivian Barry. I was very lucky mm -hmm. in my go at Wit. Wit is the kind of play that whoever's uh, 
playing the part seems to be the best actor you ever saw, just because it's a wonderful, wonderful part. And so the, I, I didn't have the privilege of seeing you do that, but I've certainly read a whole lot about it, and I've never heard anyone ever not say glowing things about what you did in it. But they, it, it's very difficult to do the play and not, you know, it's, a, it's an extraordinary part. It's a wonderful part. And I also had a wonderful director, a director named um, Derek Anson Jones, who uh, died a year, a year and a half after we opened in New York. How, how long did the play run at the time? The, my I was involved with the play for about three years. We, I did the, my first go at it was at, at the Long Wharf. Uh, and then a year later, it opened at MCC Theater in New York. And then it ran, uh, and then we moved to a larger theater, a big off-Broadway theater that so, isn't there anymore. <laughs> um, so you played the heck out of it. You played it a long time. And I played it then, and then I played it in um, Los Angeles and London. Is that all? <laughs> I, I have to go to a quote that I know that I found uh, that you talked about in terms of doing that play, which I find fascinating. And we'll go back to the performance of that in a moment. But you, you said that that play, Wit, showed the futility of condescending to an audience. And I'm not 100% sure I know what that means. So I'm wondering if you would explain that to me. And also, you know, how do plays and other scripted exercises condescend to audiences in a way that wit shows that you can't? Well, the thing about the history of wit is instructive here. It was written and from the beginning, every time somebody would read it, it would win a prize. So it won, a, won the Kessel Ring Prize the first time it went out. And they sent it out and went to every regional theater in the country. And everybody said, oh, no, no, no. It's going to play about 50-year-old woman. She has cancer. She's bald. And then if it's not about cancer, it's about John Donne. Who's going to want to see that? I don't think anybody wants to see that. I don't think so. So then it would go away. And then uh, the South Coast rep, after a couple years after the first round, the South Coast rep did the play with a wonderful actor and it won all the prizes in right. Los Angeles. Everybody thought it was just the best thing since sliced bread. And they sent it around again and everybody went, oh no, so who's it play about cancer, 50 year old woman, bald, John Donne. So it went away. And the only reason that it came back was because Derek Anson Jones, this very director, was uh, the best friend of the playwright, Margaret uh. Edson. Right. And Derek had it carried the play around with him all the time as he uh, he worked at the Shakespeare Theater for a long time in Washington. And then he uh, got an MFA in directing from Yale and he just graduated from that. And he was the assistant director to Doug Hughes uh, in a production of Henry the uh, Henry the Fifth. Yes. Hank Sank. Henry the Fifth that I was Hank doing Sank. in the park. And Derek and I knew each other from before, from the New York Theater Workshop and stuff like that. So Derek said to me, here, I have this play. My friend um, wrote this play. Would you read it? And if you like it, would you ever think of being in it? And it also happened that just at that time, my brother had been, my glamorous gay brother had been diagnosed with cancer. And so, and he was staying with us. He normally lived in San Francisco. So I read the play and the first time I read it, I fell apart, but I thought, oh, Derek wants me to play the older professor because I couldn't imagine you'd have this play and you wouldn't have anybody to play the main part. So I said, so Derek, which, <laughs> which part did you want me to think about? And he said, well, Vivian Baring. I said, oh, okay. And then so I gave it to my brother and I said to him, is this true to your experience? Right. And he came downstairs, tears streaming down his face, and said two things, yes, and if anybody ever asks you to do this play, you have to do it. And so six months later, through a variety of circumstances, I was asked to do it by Doug Hughes because Derek gave the play to Doug too. And he ended up six months later being the artistic director at the Long Wharf. Right. And uh, decided that he wanted to start the new play program again at the Long Wharf and that he wanted to have Wick be the first production. And you to be in it. 
and me to be in it, and he asked me to be in it. Obviously, that play has generated a lot of uh, interest over time, and, and in particular has been a focal point for your career. People know you from it. It's one of the, obviously, the highlights of your known career, for whatever, whatever that means. But what was it about that part that was so, I imagine it was incredibly challenging. You had to be, you had to have shave your head, you were naked in it, um, and you were dying in it, right? Yeah. So what made that go for you? What, how did you get through that all the time? Because the last moment of the play is triumphant. Ah. I, Vivian and I, ended up in a, hopeful, triumphant place. Mm -hmm. So that was a case where it was, because it, if it had ended during the code blue part, you know, then it would have been a different experience, but it ended on a note of triumph. And so it was exhilarating for me. So every performance was exhilarating in some yeah. way. Well, I mean, it's also exhilarating if you're in it, but it was the second time in my life that I've been in a play when the lights went out, it was silent. And then when the lights came up, everybody was standing up. Oh, <laughs> that happened in Angels in America, too. Did, did that, uh, was that a little freaky the first time that happened? Were you surprised mm -hmm. by it? <laughs> no, because the first time that happened, I was still trying to cope with having just been naked. <laughs> I got to put on a bathrobe before the lights came up again. So, no, I mean, yes, and it's overwhelming. You don't expect it somehow. You don't know what's going to happen because for me, the thing that is made when you act in, especially in the theater, is something that is, that is made together. Mm -hmm. with the audience. E each performance is an is a one-off. It yes. never it never repeats and it is you and the audience are making that event in the moment. Yeah. And it isn't a complete connection from the author's original idea to a complete piece of art until you have that connection, is there? No. And so it that it doesn't exist. It it doesn't exist. And then it doesn't and then it never exists again unless somebody's bothered to put a camera up. It's gone. And then it exists in some different way. R exactly. And and it exists in some different way every night, even yeah. though it's the same people in it and the same lines being read. It's different every night. And that's very hard for an audience to understand. From my perspective, I've worked on lots and lots of plays and audiences see a play once and they may never see it ever again. And they think that that was it. It's like watching a movie. They could just put it in the DVR and there it would be. Um, but for them, it is it. it. It is it. It's the one they said they know. Them, they, and they've made the thing together with the people on the stage so that it is a singular experience. All right. So I want to go back to my question, which is how, how did that play that that showed the futility of condescending to an audience. What play, what happens when a production is condescending to an audience? How does that work? Well, I mean, in that case, the condescension came from all the producers who thought nobody would get it. I see. I've they got They're it. smart enough, you know, they're moved, they know somebody who had cancer, and they've even maybe read John Donne, you know, but they assumed that people wouldn't get it. And I have to say that the most, all the work that I've done that has been the most successful has been work that people would say challenge the audience. Uh, in my, I like to think it, it's just that you assume that the audience is just as smart as you are. You're equally, you're involved in this together. So that was true of Angels in America. You know, Tony's immensely erudite and all like that, but it, people, people got it. And in Wit, people understood it. They didn't, they understood what John Donne had to do with it, that people never asked, why do you have all that poetry in there? That was never a question. See, see I, what I find so, find so fascinating, I've had a career in which I wrote 90 cartoons for kids. Woo! Okay, so w one of the things that I always approached writing every script, because I was writing for kids that were either from about the age of eight till about 16 in that group. And... I never once wrote a single word that I didn't speak to them like I was speaking to any adult. I never condescended to them. I never so so called stepped down to them. Absolutely, and I think therefore that's w why your work was successful. I mean, basically, by the time you're eight years old, you understand a whole lot. You know every and everything you're going to know, and certainly by the time you're sixteen. 
Yes. You know, in whole other societies, by the time you're 16, if you were a woman, you had three children already. So what, what it amounted to, and I don't want to digress too much, but the subject matter had to remain within a certain range. You, yes. We wouldn't have done a cartoon about someone dying of cancer. Right. That, that would not have happened. Um, so it's the subject was what you did and certain words you didn't use. But the way that you spoke and the way that you had characters speak to one another was just like a, yeah. talking to an adult. So uh, I think that that's what you're partly what you're talking about. And, and now I kind of understand it better in what you meant, that you'll never get away with uh, having a success off of being condescending to the audience. Absolutely. And, you, do, you know, it's a bad producerial tactic, it seems to me. The thing that goes along with it are that there are many actors, some wonderful actors and some people of whom I'm very fond, who have an adversarial relationship with the audience. Mm, mm. Um, And that, you know, um, my friend Ron Liebman, who was the brilliant Roy Cohn. Sure. Ron hated and feared the audience. Really? And I think it's because he had, a, you know, he suffered from terrible paralyzing stage fright, um, all, I think almost all his life, and a lot of people do. And one of the ways to, you know, to transform fear is to turn it into anger. Have you suffered from stage fright at all? I have. I've had two, two, uh, well, I can't, re- I'm just trying to think now if it was one long thing that went all the time or happened twice. I'm thinking of two plays. Yes. And, you, and it's a phobia. It's absolutely you- irrational. And it starts it feels as though you're, in my case, as though I'm being frozen from my feet up. And really? it's sort of, it's physical. It, you feel this sort of chemical thing that's happening in your body and you can't concentrate or speak or... Is it, is it akin to a panic attack? Is it that kind of a thing? Yes, I suppose. I suppose because you can't do... It's exact because you can't do the th- one thing you have to do. You can't, and it, it, it involves all your senses. You can't quite hear. You can't. It's see. overwhelming. Yeah. And it, those weren't, they didn't have to do with the audience. It was something else. It, it happened before the audience. I, so once you got to the audience, you were okay, but it was prior to it. Well, yeah, but in those cases, I had to get through it so that I could learn enough of the play. So and, what, and what did you do to get through it? I think this is an important lesson for folks. Well, I, I was seeing a therapist at the time for some th- other things. And I went to her and said, um, look, Deborah, this, I don't know what to do about this. And she said, oh, I understand. This is a practical problem, she said. I don't know. She said to me, I don't know if you know this, but my other practice is out on Long Island and I have a lot of clients who are pilots with fear of flying. Oh, Oh, wow. And she said, I see that this is a practical issue. She said, someday we can investigate the underlying things, but right now I have to make it stop. And she said, you have to not think about it and you have to actively not think about it because one of the things that phobia and PTSD and all those things have in common is that the person suffering from them keeps checking in on them Mm -hmm. to see if it's there, see if it feels uh, there's some like vertigo fascination with it. And then it starts and then it just goes. So, and sometimes it loops on itself. Yeah. And you have to get out of the, you have to break the loop somehow. So I practiced actively not thinking about it, which is hard because it tricks you. So I used to think of it as, um, you, you know, you'd be looking straight ahead and then it would sort of creep in from the right side of your eye hmm. across the screen and you had to make it go away. That's very interesting for someone who's a professional actor, an actress, to have fear of the stage. That's... <laughs> not a very good thing. So you really have to overcome that. Not very useful. And yeah. uh, you know, other people, other people. I mean, it's uh, it's common, and a lot of people self medicate, you know, do drink or drugs or something like that. You don't suffer from it today, do you? No, no. It was a very limited, acute 
period, and it involved two plays, and it went away and then it came back. It, the first play was a one, it's hard if you have um, stage fright and you're in a one person play. Oh, wow, that, so you had no one to rely on, you had no one to lean that on. That was kind of a problem. So I had, so there, I was, suffered it from there. And then I was in, um, oh God, wonderful play of Larry Kramer's called Just Say No. Okay. An early AIDS play that caused a huge scandal for all sorts of reasons. But anyway, and in the middle of rehearsals for that, I had, I couldn't do it anymore. Wow. And I, and I can't, you know, I got through it and ended up doing it. I'm very glad because it was fun. I got to play um, Nancy Reagan as a nymphomaniac. So that was fun. <laughs> I, I must say that you are even a better actress than I imagined because in no way, shape or form would I have ever imagined that this would be something that you would have gone through. So that says a lot about what you've done and overcome and, and done with your career beyond it. Um, I'm curious about working with directors and can you share any kind of take on, on what are the important lessons that you've learned from great directors? What, have, have, what kind of lessons have you learned that you've taken through your career from maybe early on or over time? What do you want a director to say when you're on a set? Well, in the movies and the television. They don't say much, do they? They don't say much. In the movies and the television, it's important that they're clear and... And what happens when they're not clear? What do you do? Well, then, because the movies and the television are so technical, then instead of playing the character, you're worried about whether you're standing in the right place or if you're right. looking at the right place or is the camera on me or, you know... So, all, all right, so, so, the, so TV and, and film are probably off the table somewhat because you're expected to sort of come in and do it. Mo you most are, of the time. and you need to be, you need to be uh, reassured by the directors in the movies and the television because the camera is, you know, right in your face and can tell if you're afraid, uncertain, if you, if you the actor, are in some way separated from the character. Well, that's the old adage that it sees into your soul. The, yeah. the, the camera sees right through you to whatever it is, who, who you are and what you're doing at that moment. Well, certainly it sees what you're thinking. No question, especially if it's in, in, especially if it's in close. Yeah. It really sees what you're thinking. All right, so let's look at the stage then. When you get in, start a play, what is it that you want the director? The director's your partner in, the director is your first audience. The director is seeing you for the first time and making judgments in some way and encouraging you to do something one way or another. Um, what is it that you're looking for from a good director? The best, well, let's see, the best director. No, everybody has a different sort of way. Well, I bet they do, but sure. The, the, again, it's reassurance. It's more important when you're doing something to know certainly in the beginning, what you're doing right, that's more important than what you're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. Because what you're doing wrong, sort of, if it's all about that, it sort of shuts you down. It, it helps when directors say or let you know, either positively or by silence, that the direction that everybody's going is the right direction. The other thing that's important is to make the company so that everybody is doing the same thing. You're all pulling the rope in the same direction. In the same direction. There are some directors who, you know, choose a, a punching bag, a sort of as though that's a good thing. You know, you sort of cut somebody out from the herd and make a punching bag of them. And, and exa they become the exemp exemplar of what not to do. Yes, they become the sin eater. Th that, can't be, that can't be fun for a company it's at awful, all. awful, because it makes you feel complicit in that cruelty. The other thing is that there are some directors, George Wolf had a great gift for, at critical moments, telling each person the thing that that person needed to know isn't that great? in order to in order to actualize the performance and do you feel like he knew what that was going to be before he walked in that day or was it something that was and happening that, in the moment 
I one of the one that I remember, which is the most dramatic when, you know, when everything's on the line, when you're, you know, in Angels in America on Broadway and the New York Times is in the audience and you're not supposed to know. But of course, everybody knows that the New York Times, you're not supposed to tell anybody, you know, but somehow. So that night, George walked around to everybody in the cast separately and said something to them. And I don't know what he said to anybody else, but I know what he said to me. Mm. He said to me, Kathy, just be clear. Now, my whole thing is being clear. That's my deal, you know? If I, right. I pat myself on the back about anything, it said I'm clear. And so that was perfect because that was, well, you know, Jesus, George. <laughs> I know that. And it meant you hit the stage on fire. Right. And I had, you know, I opened the play as an ancient rabbi. Right. Um, so that was important because you had to get people's attention. Um, and I, I have never, that was exactly the thing to say to me. Exactly. Yeah. So that's really great when you have a director that knows what to say to an actor or actress to make things right. work well. And then sometimes when earlier on, my friend um, David Schweitzer, who is a wonderful, wonderful director, and this was the first play I was ever in with David. It was a very, um, it was Chuck Mee's first play. And it was called The Investigation of the Murder in El Salvador. And it was a little bit opaque. In fact, it was so opaque that what, in fact, Chuck meant it to be opaque. And he said, <laughs> He wrote in the notes for the play that the audience read before. I don't care. I don't want anybody to understand what the play is about. Oh, God. So that was a little difficult. So anyway, so I was doing this play, and David, uh, David was so cool, and there were people from the Mabu Mines in the play, and it was just really amazing. And I had a complete crisis of confidence about 15 minutes before a very important performance that we were doing of the play at I seem at the I forget which museum at the no at the Guggenheim we're at the Guggenheim right so there we are play Guggenheim and I said to David I just I don't know what I'm doing and David looked at me and said I don't do very well with I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> <laughs> Another moment when you thought, well, I just better pull myself together here. I, I don't do well with, when, with what I don't know what I'm doing either. That's not helpful. <laughs> right. So, um, I, I want to touch on a couple of quick items that I think are important. You're well known for being involved in social causes, in politics, and especially in the arts, behind the scenes in the arts. Uh, from your perspective, how important are the arts? and politics and social causes to being a better artist? How has that helped you be a better artist by being involved in these other things? I can only speak for myself. I wouldn't sure. presume to speak for anybody else. Uh, I have felt lucky to be able to use whatever platform I had to move forward things that seemed important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems one of the necessities of good citizenship, which is something that's being questioned now, yes, is to move toward the greatest good for the greatest number, to seek for social justice. Um, and I grew up, you know, I grew, I was born in 1945. So I grew up after the Second World War when we imagined, we nice privileged white people, imagined that we were covered in virtue and we're doing all kinds of great stuff. And we did all kinds of great stuff for all us nice white people, privileged mm -hmm. or not. My family were working class people, but still. Um, but the society cannot function unless there is justice for all, or unless we move close to justice for all. Do you find and, yourself wanting to, to work on projects? I'm, I'm talking about plays or whatnot. Um, do you find yourself wanting to work on things that promote those, those thoughts? Yes, and I've been very lucky to have been able to do that. I, you know, you get offered things that you're interested in. There, sometime, there was one time when I begged, I begged to be in a play called uh, Guantanamo, Honor Bound to Defend Freedom that I knew was coming to New York. And I had six weeks when I could be in it, and I wanted to be in it a lot, and I got to be in it. Well, well that's, you know, that's a nice thing perk, I guess, of, of having been there and done that. Yeah, that was a, 
That was a great thing. So you seek out things that help to promote those um, causes or ideas that you have. And though, you know, it's also it's the people you know. So I, the writers that I know are interested in those things too. And so they're most likely to send plays like that. Well, well of course, that, that once it's known that you are of a certain philosophy or whatever that would be, then yes, that's going to come your way. I would expect it to, especially when you're well-established. Probably a little less so when you're an unknown, when you've never worked before. Absolutely. And the other side of that is that I've had the luxury of turning down things that I didn't approve of or turning down things that I didn't want to give my name or my, you know, often that, I mean, that happens often on television that, you know, there's some script you read and you think, I, I don't believe what these people are saying and I can't do this. But I've had the luxury to turn it down. It's harder for other people. Well, yes, my imagination tells me that there are lots and lots of actors at the beginning of their career who need the money yeah. and, and want to make their bones somehow and will take a job that is antithetical to the way they think. Absolutely. And then they, you can rationalize that by saying, I'm an actor doing a job as an actor. I'm not promoting a cause. But when you have the luxury, like you say, to be able to turn things down, then you can promote those causes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very good. Okay. Well, last couple of questions for you. You've had this wonderful career and clearly you've worked with a ton of people and had lots of experiences. Can you share with us um, any time where uh, you've had a quirky, offbeat, oddball, strange, or just plain funny thing happen? Well, there are two I think of, one from Angels in America and one from Wit. And the one, the one from Angels in America is in, in Angels in America, I played two men. One of them was the rabbi. And for some reason, I could always do the rabbi. Okay. Uh, I don't know why I, I could, you know, from my, I always say my Christmas and Easter Episcopalian roots, but somehow the Rebbe was there, he was there. <laughs> and how he walked was a little bit, uh, my father-in-law who was suffering from Parkinson's disease. Um, so, you know, I had, I, somehow the Rebbe, both his way he spoke and the way he walked moved. But the other person I played, and the harder scene actually, was that I played the doctor who told Roy Cohn that he had AIDS. Mm -hmm. And of course, whoever played Roy Cohn, in my case, it was Ron Liebman, um, was a fierce man. And I was supposed to, and I was supposed to win. The doctor's supposed to win in that scene. So, and Angels was a very male world. Um, there was almost all men and most of the characters were men and it was mostly men. So I would do the scene as the doctor thinking I was being as strong as I could possibly be. And the guys would say, you know, no, you're just giving in. I couldn't figure out what it was, how it was doing. I thought maybe it's the way I'm sitting. So I went home and asked Henry to take off all his clothes, my husband, Henry and sit on the stairs so I could see where he put his, his uh, private parts and see if that made a difference, you know, how you sat. So I watched, I tried that, didn't seem to make any difference. And, and it was getting to be a serious problem because every day everybody's losing their temper and I was losing my confidence, whatever. And then I forget what the epiphany was, but I saw somehow, that when men argue with each other, they move into the argument. Mm -hmm. And when women argue, particularly with men, you establish a safe place. And that's feels, that feels like strength to a woman. Moving into an argument feels dangerous because they're bigger than you are. You know? Right. So anyway, once I figured that out, then I could do the doctrine. That oh, was that's really cool. That's, so that was very cool. And then the other thing was, a, <laughs> as you mentioned a couple of times, at the very end of Wit, I was naked. And the play, um, the play was a little hard on doctors. <laughs> so often, and this didn't happen once, this happened a whole bunch of times. I would go out after and there'd be people waiting after to talk about the play. And often there would be doctors in their 50s or so who would come up to me and say, you are so brave. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about my wonderful acting or the script or how I died or anything else. It was because a 
however old I was, 50 some year old woman was standing naked on the stage. And right. I thought, not just a damn minute here. <laughs> and why they felt compelled to say that. I, it seemed to me to be the apotheosis of, uh, of uh, passive aggression. <laughs> well, I think, I think they're used to being in their private room. And here you were in a, in a big room full of people. <laughs> oh, it was because they were mad and I'd said bad things about doctors. Oh, 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 that's it. <laughs> I think it was passive aggression. Because only, it was only men, who only 50 some medical men who did no, that. No, no female doctors said this to you. No. no <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, last question for you. Can you uh, share a great piece of advice or a tip for those who may be starting out and trying to figure out how to have a life in the theater or in the acting business, or perhaps they're in a little bit and trying to get to that next level? I would say, I say this all the time, to not to do what I did, not to doubt yourself. What that means in the this world, for the most part, is most actors should probably think about going to a good graduate school, not because uh, necessarily what you'll learn, you might learn something, but because of the other people who will be there, who will challenge you, and the connections that you will make. I would say, by the same token, don't do an undergraduate major in the theater, because, you know, the theater is just the same everywhere, from you know, in your back room when you hang up a curtain to some community theater, to, to, to high school, to, it's always the same. So, and it's entirely uh, self reflect, it's reflexive. So if you're going, if you're an undergraduate and you want to be an actor, then spend your four years or whatever learning something. Because what, you're, what the job is, is to turn into somebody else. And you don't have to, you don't have to be a nuclear physicist, but you have to sound like a nuclear physicist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the more you know, the more you have to bring to the bring to the job. Well, that's two two phenomenal pieces of advice in there. Uh, one is is that go and educate yourself in the world. That's the first thing because you're going to play characters who are of the world and not just you. And the the second thing is is to um, to go to school in order to expand your horizons of your social circle, which I think is at least half of the reason why you go to school, is mm -hmm. to meet people. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I've been teaching for 10 years or so here in Pittsburgh, and I think that school is at least as important uh, for socialization as it is for uh, education. And Absolutely. And then the other, and I would add to that, Learn to do as many things as you can do. Juggle, fence, dance, sing. Because you never know when you're going to be called on to use it. Nope. <laughs> and all of those things, because the job also, the other part of the job is to, to move forward at the speed of thought. Oh, that's great. Move forward at the speed of thought. That's fantastic. I, I, um, I find it very interesting that you didn't focus on the being in acting classes. You focused on other things, which I think is really important. Yeah. Because you can get acting classes outside of school. Right? Yes, you can. You can. And every, I mean, I, my best friend and my oldest friend in New York is the best teacher of anything I know, uh, an acting teacher in New York named K. Michael Patton. And if, if you can study with Kay, then you don't have to go to graduate school. Yeah, I believe that. Well, Kathleen Chalfant, this has just been a fantastic hour plus on Story Beat. And I cannot thank you enough for, for being with us today and sharing all of your experiences and all of your great advice. And so I, I'm really delighted that you joined me today. Thank you so much for asking me. It's been great. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.